Hi, it's my pleasure to share with you our work on scalable solar driven water production devices. This work that I'm going to talk about is certainly a collaboration with many of my students, as highlighted here, as well as my postdocs, including also collaborators at Shanghai Jiatong University. Um, so, uh, in particular, we've been interested in solar driven water projection devices for uh, developing compact solutions for arid environments. And the motivation for our work can be very clear as you look at the scare water scarcity in the world. What you see here is that certainly many parts of the world have in, are experiencing particularly water crises. And there are many parts of the world that in fact have months, actually almost the whole year, by which there is no water available for access. We can also look at the world's mapping in terms of global relative humidity. You can see that in particular, that there are certain regions in the world that are quite arid in the climate. And in particular, in a lot of those regions, also there is very limited infrastructure. Fortunately, we can think about also as we overlay the solar energy of the, and the mapping of the global solar energy that you can see that in many parts of these arid climates, there's quite an abundance of sunlight. And this is where we believe that there is an opportunity for solar powered water technologies to enable uh, clean drinking water for the world. So I'll start off and share with you some progress um, that we've made in water harvesting that's powered by sunlight. Now, one of the resources that we have is in fact water in the air, and it's equivalent to about 14% of fresh water in lakes on earth. So there's quite an abundance of water. I think the question is, can we harness that water from the air to create clean drinking water? Certainly this is not a new concept. Existing water harvesting technologies have existed for some time. When the humidity is relatively high, then in fact, you can use fog harvesting and that in fact, you can catch the droplets of water onto these various nets to now then create the clean drinking water. However, this only works for very high humidity conditions, essentially near 100%. And the more common one then is known as dewing. So the idea with dewing is that you use refrigeration system as was shown here on the bottom and that when you actually condense below the dew point, so using refrigeration to condense below the dew point, in fact, then you can extract the clean water. Now you can imagine that in this case, that dewing can be relatively inefficient depending on the humidity and temperature conditions. What I plot here is the efficiency as a function of the relative humidity and also a function of what the ambient temperature is. You can see that at relatively high humidity conditions, in fact, you can have a reasonable efficiency. However, as you go to lower relative humidities, you get to a point where doing becomes nearly infeasible. And this is about less than about 40% relative humidity, and that is typical of arid climates. So this poses a challenge for the community in terms of how do we actually extract water from the air when we have low humidity environments? And this is where we've been working for some time when we started this collaboration with Professor Omar Yagi's group at Berkeley, where we've invented a new approach to harvesting water from air and particularly targeting the low humidity conditions. The system is shown on your left. And the idea here is we take advantage of a novel material set known as metal organic frameworks. In this case, here's a schematic of the structure. It's a porous material, in fact, a three-dimensional framework that can now adsorb water molecules into its surface topography. And so by which we incorporate these MOFs into a layer, we can now capture the water when this material is dry. And then in the sunlight, in the daytime, we can now take advantage of the sunlight in the form of heat to now release the water from the porous material and condense it near ambient conditions. 
So this is an exciting opportunity because now it doesn't rely on refrigeration as I shared with you earlier on doing. And that this, this now like relies heavily on the materials choices. So as I mentioned, we're using, we were starting off with MOF 801. And the reason for that is shown here. So this I show is a water isotherm. This is looking at the water uptake as a function of the relative humidity. And MOF 801 has really an excellent isotherm to be able to now capture water and release water at low humidity conditions as highlighted by this isotherm shape. While certainly the uptake is not as high as some of these other metal organic frameworks, however, the humidity where it kind of, there is a steep rise in the humidity is in the conditions for the very arid climates, as I mentioned. So our first prototype we demonstrated in 2007, where you can see here, we were able to create a device very much like the schematic where we integrated the metal organic frameworks into this porous material and we capture the water at night and in the daytime we exposed it sunlight on the rooftop of MIT and released the water condensed it onto a thermoelectric cooler in this case to control the temperature of the condensing surface and here we can see that clearly from the images it can in fact get the water droplets from the device this was a very exciting breakthrough at that time and certainly you could say well where is the actual amount of drinking water? You can see droplets of water, but it's not really significant. And part of it has been related to the material, the amount of material we can incorporate into our prototype at that time. Now that was also demonstrated at MIT. And what we've done since then is tested it in a more um, appropriate climate that is arid, such as that in Tempe, Arizona. Here, I want to highlight um, the temperature as a function of time for a typical day in Phoenix, Sky Harbor. And you can see from here that, in fact, what I wanted to highlight is in these kinds of arid climates, sometimes the dew point can, in fact, be negative. And this, as I mentioned, is a condition by which dew harvesting can be extremely um, energy intensive, in fact, because you have to freeze water to actually then extract the water. So we wanted to test our device in these kinds of arid climates to help us demonstrate that in fact our water harvesting technology in fact is can work and be effective in these challenging climates. And so what we've shown in fact is a modification of a device that we demonstrated earlier um, and in fact we made some modifications to further enhance performance. Um, but the key here is also that instead of using a thermoelectric cooler now we're using an air cooled heat sink, which is more representative of the type of device we anticipate. And with this kind of device, we were able to also demonstrate effective water harvesting. Now I show you a video here, in fact, of the water harvesting behavior as we release the water from the metal organic framework layer. And in fact, you'll see that the viewport fogs up. And as heat is being more applied more to the system, you start to see that the view window now, um, now gets rid of the, 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 the condensed water on that viewport. And again, you can see that there are nice water droplets that form that suggest that this kind of a technology works. Of course, the challenge has been scalability um, to demonstrate actually a larger quantity of water. And this is where we've been working on for the past couple of years now is working towards developing water harvesting at larger scales. And that's what I'll show you here in our recent work in that we've developed a new concept. This is more focused on the actual design of the water harvesting system. And what we've proposed, in fact, instead of using a single layer, as I showed previously, is a multi-stage concept. The idea is having two layers of adsorbent for exposed sunlight to the top layer and in fact, we can now take advantage of the condensation heat that re and recycle that latent heat of condensation to drive desorption from a subsequent layer. And through this process, we can in fact demonstrate increased daily, daily productivity, which is captured by how many liters of water over the area per day. And in fact, also higher efficiencies compared to that of a single stage. Also, in addition to this, because we're using this kind of infrastructure, we needed to now explore other materials that are more scalable. 
And so we've been looking at zeolites that are commercially available such that we can actually extract a reasonable quantity of water. The material that we're using, as I mentioned, is a zeolite known as Aquazoa Zeo-1. It's commercially available in large quantities. In addition to that, um, it has an isotherm as shown here. And you can see here that it's really good also at reasonably low humidity conditions. We have low regeneration temperatures. And further, what's really critical in the design of these kinds of systems is um, the materials kinetics in terms of the rates by which we can actually capture and release the water from the material. So we've been able to now characterize material properties, including the isotherm, the crystal size, absorption enthalpy, and the diffusion coefficients, um, put them into models that help us now optimize device design. And so that's what we'll show you in the results for the next few slides. So here, what I'll show you is the configuration that we've been looking at in terms of our modeling and actually our prototype development. You can see, as I mentioned, it's a two layer type device. And what you can see here clearly from our analysis is what I'm plotting here is, is water harvested liters per meter squared per day as a function of the hot temperature, which is in fact the top layer where you're exposing the sunlight to the adsorbent. Um, and also on this axis here is efficiency of the device. You can see clearly when comparing a single stage compared to a dual stage that you have to reach a reasonable amount, a high enough temperature at the top absorbent layer to in fact achieve the desired effect of higher efficiency and a higher amount of water harvested for this kind of dual stage. And so this has been our target in thinking about our design by which we want to be able to now expose enough sunlight um, to be able to reach this temperature about, about 90 to 100 degrees. And this lends itself then to actually getting more water harvested as well as increasing efficiency of the device. And in fact, we've been able to build this based on understanding of the various aspects of the design. Here is an image of the actual device, what it looks like. You can see that it's significantly larger than our previous prototypes. And by incorporating the zeolites in here, you can see into four tiles as we placed onto um, this copper sheet, you can now integrate it. And also on the back side, we have a finned kind of design for the heat, ex heat exchange out to the ambient to dissipate the heat, as well as fans to now kind of effectively more move the air out. And this is what the prototype looks like in our on the rooftop of MIT, as well as we can show the amount of water that we can actually extract the, from this kind of two stage device. And you can see that, in fact, you can extract now a reasonable quantity that it fits into a beaker of about 60 milliliters. We can also, also look at the temperature as a function of time and also looking at the solar flux here on to the right. You can see here that the solar flux is a kind of what it looks like over the kind of the day. And uh, in fact, if you look at the temperature of the solar absorber, the top absorbent, the bottom absorbent, as well as the top condenser and the bottom condenser and the ambient conditions. One thing to highlight is because of the larger scale device, there is, in fact, a capacitance of the system that now kind of slows down the response time of the overall device. And that's something to consider as we think about designing these devices. However, what we look at the water harvested as a function of time, in fact, you can see that the results from a um, kind of a dual stage device are pretty promising. In fact, what you see here, the total is highlighted in blue and the top layer, the amount of water extracted from the top layer is in red and the amount extracted from the bottom layer is that in green. And you can see that in fact, that we've been able to extract about points, almost 0.8 liters per meter squared per day. That's about twice the productivity of a single stage. 
And what this suggests is that there is significant promise in this type of approach to design the system by which we have a two stage as compared to a single stage type device to enable higher productivity of water, as well as a higher efficiency as we think about developing these kind of water harvesting technologies for clean water access. Now, I thought I'd switch gears a little bit and share with you some other work that we've been working on in our lab in developing solar-driven, multi-stage solar stills. And it kind of, it builds on some of the work that I just shared in using a multi-stage type configuration to be able to recycle the latent heat of condensation to drive, in this case, desalination. Certainly, also in often arid climates, there can be salty streams of water, and we can take advantage of small-scale desalination devices that can facilitate the access of this salty water to clean water via evaporation and condensation. And there's been quite a lot of work in recent years to investigate different approaches by which you can try to um, enhance evaporation and condensation processes and these types of device architectures to achieve higher efficiency. Examples are shown here as development of novel material sets, as well as also novel configurations to now create these highly efficient desalination devices. Certainly there are still opportunities ahead because the past solar desalination techniques have limitations. The first is that still the water production is relatively low because of the limited efficiency still, while there's been interest in pushing this efficiency, there are extra transport resistances due to the closed system, as well as vaporization enthalpy loss to the environment that limits ultimately the efficiency and water production. Also, the second is a limited a flexibility of the choice of materials. Often, um, selective spectral absorptance is needed and a good workability to actually draw the, the salt water into the device, as well as high thermal insulation. Because of these constraints, often the choice of materials are limited. So what we proposed is a multi-stage configuration that has we call thermally localized multi-stage desalination. And what we're doing here is we're combining the effect of now vaporizing at the interface via heat and also recycling the vaporization enthalpy via the creation of multiple stages in this device. So the key novelties here then are decoupling the functions of the actual solar absorption, the insulation, and the water transport, by which now we have a single absorber that collects the sunlight, and then the subsequent layers, in fact, don't require the use of expensive absorber. And in fact, we can use pretty low cost wicks that can now transport the water and evaporate it and condense it to create clean drinking water. And so the second novelty of this, in fact, is enhanced efficiency because of the use of multiple stages by recycling the vaporization enthalpy. And so we've demonstrated this in addition to also doing detailed design efforts. And what we've shown with this thermally localized multi-stage still, here we have a 10 stacked stage device. You can see here, in fact, we're using relatively low cost components. So we have a nylon frame that now on the top where we have the solar absorption happen, we introduce a sheet um, that's coated with a selective solar absorber that then interfaces with the aerogel, an optically transparent silica aerogel that allows us to minimize the thermal losses. And meanwhile, we use an evaporative towel, it's essentially just paper towel, to now dry, draw the liquid in from the salt solution. And it serves as a wick that then, uh, because of the heat now interfaced, um, first at the absorber layer, it evaporates and it condenses. And on each subsequent layer of condensation, it releases heat. And then you can utilize that heat to evaporate the subsequent um, stage and then ultimately get a relatively high efficient device. And the materials costs in this case are low. We estimate that it's about $1.50 per unit. 
And actually 70% of that comes from the actual nylon frame. So you can imagine as we start to scale that this could be reduced, that this cost can be reduced significantly. And so we've taken now this kind of multi-stage device configuration and done some laboratory test experiments under one sun, so about 1,000 watts per meter squared of illumination using a solar simulator. This is a schematic showing the inner, how we interface now this multi-stage configuration with a solar simulator, as well as a measurement of the water that we actually create uh, via a scale. And we can look at the temperature of the individual to stages. And we can see, of course, as we expect that a 10 stage mass change should be drastically different than a single stage because of the significant more amount of water that's produced or uh, uh, in this process. And um, you can see here that the efficiency of a 10 stage device is also much higher than that of a single stage as expected. And also one of insul insulated 10 stage, of course, is also better. So from these laboratory experiments, we've shown that we can have a steady state production rate of about 5.8 liters per meter squared hour with a thermal efficiency, a solar thermal efficiency of 385%. And we know that the first initial stages, the first three in fact, contribute to about 45% of the total water production. And um, the results of this multi-stage using this 10 stage design gives us about a five time improvement compared to that of a single stage design. So when we look at the analysis and kind of compare it to what has been done in the past, you can see by being able to now kind of utilize the components we shared, as well as also the multi-stage type design, our efficiencies can be greatly enhanced in addition to the production rates as well. And so this is a really exciting result in thinking about these low cost um, compact desalination units. Of course, we wanted to also demonstrate this um, uh, capability out in outdoor conditions, which is more relevant to um, the realistic situation. And so we placed this uh, device that we've created on the rooftop of MIT again. And you can see the water collection rate as a function of time, as well as from the solar flux, from the sunlight. And over this duration, about five hours, we were able to collect about 70 milliliters of water um, with the record high pro average productivity of about 2.6 liters per kilowatt per hour. So we are very excited about the opportunities ahead with this kind of multi-stage still technology that can enable now another approach to now deliver clean drinking water. So to summarize, um, we've demonstrated now two different approaches, one of which we take advantage of water harvesting from air, as well as desalination using sunlight as a means to now create clean drinking water. We think there's certainly many opportunities ahead. And um, with that, I'd like to close and thank you all for your attention and also acknowledge all the tremendous funding as well as collaborators we've had to be able to execute as well as my tremendous students and postdocs that really have done all the work. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions.